All right, we're live. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Facilitating XYZ Live. My name is Sam Killerman. I'm one of the co-hosts of this show. I'm one of the co-facilitators of Facilitating XYZ, which is a free online resource for all facilitators. Uh, I'm really excited about today's episode because we're going to be geeking out about Legos, which is something I haven't talked about this as much um, since I was a kid and something I, I could say I, I would love to talk about more. Um, Jackie and Steve are our guests, and on this show, our goal is to try to um, learn from other facilitators in such a way that um, all facilitators could benefit from the learning. So that's uh, what we're going to be doing today. And I'll let Meg introduce herself and then Jackie and Steve will have y'all introduce yourselves as well. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Meg Bolger. I'm one of the other co-facilitators of Facilitating XYZ and co-host of this show. And like Sam, uh, I was a big Lego fan as a kid. And the idea that like a childhood passion and now a more adulthood -y passion are coming together to <clears throat> to meet is really cool. So I'm really excited to to dig in today, and it's also awesome we have a, like a pair of co-facilitators um, with us. Me and Sam co-facilitate together when we're in the same spaces sometimes, and I'm excited that we get to we get to dig into with some co-facilitators ourselves. So um, Jackie and Steve, thanks so much for being on. I was just wondering if you can tell us a little bit about yourselves. Hello. Wow. Thank you so much for inviting us to uh, to join you for this. It's, it's great to uh, to be able to speak about Lego, one of our favorite things in the whole world. Um, so I'm I'm Jackie Lloyd Smith, and um, my company is Strategic Play. I'm Stephen Walling. I am one of Jackie's facilitators here at Strategic Play. And what we primarily do is we. Um, use Lego Series Play methods in our work, and then we also train people to use Lego Series Play methods. So we're trainers of facilitators as well as we're also facilitators. Awesome. I so we're definitely going to dig into that, um, and but before we get into that specific like the work that y'all are doing now, I'd love to hear from both of you just a bit about your um, a bit about the the story that led to you ending up in this space. So tell us about. Um, your childhood, about your high school experience, college, whatever comes to mind that you think would be helpful to make sense for Meg and I, um, how y'all ended up as LEGO Series Play facilitators working together. All right. Yeah. <clears throat> OK, so um, <laughs> high school, boy, it's going back. But uh... whatever, whatever <laughs> speaks to you, um, ex tell me about what you, no, whatever speaks to you. <laughs> OK, so my story is that after after high school, um, I really wanted to work with children with, that had learning disabilities, so that was an interest for me. And I went off and I um, actually took fine art. So I took a college program, really because I wasn't sure exactly which program I should take. So I took fine art. Um, the fine art program led me to becoming an art and play therapist. So. I took a course um, and received a certificate in both play therapy and art therapy. And then I registered with the American Art Therapy Association, which I'm still a registered member. Um, my first job was working for correctional institutions with uh, youth. So I worked with um, youth from 16 to about 19 years old. And I worked in a psychology department. So then I was a, they trained me to be a psychometrist as well. Um, and I did that for quite a long time, <laughs> like six years or, or, or so. And then I went to work in children's treatment. And I was working in children's treatment. I was hired again as a, um, as a therapist. And eventually, as you do, the older you get, the, they start promoting you. And I became the director of this children's treatment facility. And um, I went back to school. I did a master's degree. The first one I did was in conflict analysis and management because there's lots of conflict in the child welfare system. Um, that not in my backyard syndrome needs to be managed. And uh, and of course, you know, the children that we were looking after were constantly in conflict uh, with families and agencies and, and whatnot. Um, and then I I went back to school again and I did another master's degree and the second one I did was an M was an MBA and when I did my MBA I wasn't really sure I was getting further and further away from the creative work that I loved um, and I read an article a finance article and it just had one line in it that mentioned that Lego had created an application 
for uh, to deal with people problems. Um, so it was like during mergers and acquisitions that often people get into uh, conflicts that, you know, it's easy to bring uh, the finances together and bricks and mortar, but not so easy to bring people. And so this art article mentioned that Lego had an application for people to work on issues. And I thought, aha, that sounds like art and play therapy. I need to dig into that. And um, I had a student working for me at the time who spent the summer trying to figure out what Lego were up to. And finally, Lego uh, called me back and said that they were at the beginning stages of rolling this out to consultants and invited me to take the training. And so I took the training and really, I never looked back. I thought, this is totally perfect because it allows me to bring, you know, that art and play therapy approach into boardrooms. And um, I just really found that people would get into these conversational roundabouts and would really have trouble you know, sorting through what they really felt, what they really meant. Um, and the Lego, it, it bench jumps all those issues. So once I found the Lego, um, then I, I, I had actually started a consulting company uh, before I did the MBA. So I thought, okay, this is what I'm going to do with my consulting company. I'm going to focus on using creative tools and use it in order to do problem solving. And so, you know, that was in 2000 and for around 2004, I started doing lots of problem solving. And um, when I did do investigations that were related to conflict, often I would find out that really it was poor management or it was miscommunication or it was, you know, some other poorly managed situation that ended up creating a conflict. So I started using the Lego more for best practices and for leadership development and then um, looking at innovation and change. So now most of the work we do are around um, facilitating has to do with change, uh, problem solving, um, and getting leaders uh, ready to facilitate change. So, and we do that, we just do that with all kinds of creative tools, everything that's visual. So a big part of it's Lego, but we also use other uh, visual tools as well. Great, thank you, Jeff. All right. You're welcome. Funny, I came full circle back into that art therapy after a, a few years away from it. Interesting. All right, so maybe I'll introduce myself. Uh, I'm Stephen Walling, and uh... oh no, <laughs> did we lose them? Y'all, oh, you can't hear them either, Meg. No, their screen just cut out. Okay, y'all, if you can hear us. Uh, Close your window and, and jump back in. Uh, we'll just hold the space. Um, if you're out there, <laughs> <laughs> we'll hold the space. Uh, facilitator commercial breaks include. Yeah, uh, everybody go to the restroom. Um, there were so many things in, in what Jackie just said that I'm ready to already dive into, and I was just taking notes. But um, I am resisting. Well, are y'all there? It's so interesting too because they're not cutting out. Um, they're not. They're, there's no glitching. It is full bore or working. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, and in, in this, <laughs> there we go. Okay, so they dropped that. Uh, so, sorry for everybody who's tuned in. Okay, they're back. Are y'all? Yes. Okay. Cool. We just kind of talked. We we are weirdly not good at improv. Improv in that moment. All right, Steve. Tell us about yourself. Okay. Um, so I'm Stephen Walling, and I've been at Strategic Play for the last six years. I really fell into facilitation and this position. I started my career um, as a bicycle mechanic. I was a bike mechanic for many, many years. So I worked in that industry from, um, I think, 14 until 24. And then I went to school for guitar building. I've been playing for, I think, about 15 or 16 years now. and. After that program, um, you know, your choices are really to continue on with carpentry or to open your own uh, manufacturing practice. And I really didn't have the funds or really the capacity to do that. And so I went back to school and then I did a, um, a fine woodworking program. And after that, uh, the economy was really quite weak and my choices were to go get a job in, um, in the cabinetry. Um, area of carpentry and 
And so that really wasn't that attractive to me. And um, I found a, uh, a position for strategic play, just working in the office. And I thought I'd take it as a temporary position. And it just kind of, everything fell into place. Uh, I got my Lego certification in, uh, within the first couple of weeks of working at strategic play. And it really was quite eye-opening. And uh, after that, traveling around with Jackie, picking up certifications, things like Myers-Briggs, creative problem solving, attending various conferences, and really working on my facilitation shops from the back of the room. And then I went back to university for executive coaching. And so I found that coaching and facilitation are a real natural fit. And uh, the Lego is a, is a, has a real coaching approach in the way that it, it rolls out in a uh, facilitated application. Cool. So, uh, yeah, I would say that's me in a nutshell. Was there, was there anything in like your like in your middle school, high school, college experience that where you saw facilitation in action, or like it was was strategic play like really your first introduction to like that type of environment at all? Yeah, I, I had absolutely no idea what uh, facilitation was. I didn't know that that was a career path. Uh, it was the same with coaching, actually. I really wasn't sure what coaching was, but everyone kept saying, you're going to be a great coach. And so finally, I thought, okay, I should probably go and check this out. So <laughs> you know, it's really, uh, really happenstance. Cool. That's awesome. Yeah, good to know. So, so you all have mentioned uh, a lot about your work. Um, uh, both before the call and, and and we've even heard little nuggets. But if you were to give the um, like the elevator pitch, so to speak, of of what strategic play does, um, how would you do that? How would you explain that? Um, so what we tell people is that we're problem solvers, and then we say, but we do it with creative tools like Lego Serious Play. And as soon as people hear Lego, they're like, what? Lego? How do, you, how do you work with Lego? Often, sometimes they'll think that we actually, um, that we must be mistaken. Like, you know, they'll clarify, like, Lego brick. And then we say, yes, the Lego brick, you know? And then we say, you know the thing kids play with? Well, we play with them only in a serious way with adults. And so that that is usually a great conversation starter. Um, I think that linking problem solving, you know, everybody knows they have to make decisions fit faster, quicker, smarter. Um, everybody seems to get the idea that they need to collaborate, that it can't be top down anymore, that it needs to be with, um, with, with the people that are the closest to actually uh, doing the work are the ones that are most likely to solve the problem. So, um, you know, kind of using that action research approach. And I think that when people start thinking, okay, it's collaborative and we hear from everyone, uh, yeah, that, that's kind of interesting. So I do, I do think that a lot of people are really realizing that even consultants that are subject matter experts need to use more of a consulting approach or a facilitative approach uh, to the consulting work because coming in and telling people what to do, it doesn't work. And I think that people are realizing that the only way that change occurs or that we can really solve problems and have things to be sustainable is if we bring everyone into the table, get all the right stakeholders in the room, and we level the playing field so everyone has a voice. And so often when we, you know, we mention the Lego and they kind of get that idea that those are the underpinnings, um, people are quite interested into, you know, what it works and how it works. We often, well, we name drop a little bit as well. So we'll sometimes say, oh, yes, well, we did this with United Nations or we've done this with Procter & Gamble. So we, we kind of were shameless about um, <laughs> about that part because that really also makes people say, oh, well, maybe this is serious if we can do it with some good companies and, you know, I want to hear more. And that's what I was going to ask is, is do you feel like when you say the Lego thing is the initial gut reaction one of um, – like dismissal or one of like, oh, we should do this? Like, what do you feel like you tend to have to push uh, or what do you what do you work with in that moment? Well, people, if they're dismissed, if people dismiss us, then, you know, like I was at my lawyer's office and I, he said, what do you do? And I explained it to him and he went, well, that sounds really childhood. You know, that just sounds ridiculous. And I just, yeah. okay. So I really feel like if people are, if people kind of put the wall up, then, I don't bother because I, I have other things to do, you know, than to try to convince somebody. 
but it's the people that are, you know, the, the curious people, the people that are um, big picture thinkers, the people that are um, open to, you know, a lot of people recognize that the old way of doing things doesn't work. And so those are the kinds of people that are like, really, tell me more. Those are the people I'm more interested in talking to. So we really don't convince anyone. We use more of a pull strategy than a push strategy. Um, because we just, you know, our whole philosophy really isn't to convince anybody anyway. I was going to say that the, the pull strategy, like, goes right back to what you were saying around, like, e consultants approaching their work from a more facilitated place, right? That um, if you ha you can't push people to change, right? You can just, like, in invite them into that. And it seems like even with your, um, like, initial interactions with people, that's that's part of your philosophy. Yeah, I don't know. Is there anything you want to add to that? I Yeah, I think that for us, we're really open about the fact that we use creativity and collaboration in our work. And if we, we meet any resistance, then that's great because we know that that client isn't for us. And I think that it's easy to, you know, really go down rabbit holes chasing clients, looking for work. And if they're not a fit for you, um, it's just, it's a real, it's a real waste of resources. So we're really upfront about the fact that we're fun. Um, that we're serious, we use creativity, and uh, if people aren't on board, then that's okay. We'll um, we attract the people that want to be working with us. Yeah. You know, it, it's funny because that is not unique to LEGO facilitators, right? So many facilitators we've talked to, when they do something that might feel like it's non-traditional in a workplace, they experience uh, a pushback that might be similar. Like experiential educators have mentioned things kind of similar, like you know, using games or using um, even just icebreakers. And the, one of the facilitators we interviewed yesterday who does graphic facilitation um, was mentioning that idea of like people not wanting to have um, like doodles all over their workplace and like wanting to have like a certain, like this is a professional environment. And it's funny because for y'all, I mean like Legos are, are definitely I was wondering if it'd be a very different pushback, but it feels like it's very similar to the pushback that facilitators encounter just in general. Um, with the, without the pushback, or um, like once you have somebody who's, who's on board and wants to work with you, um, how do you design a training or what, what goes into that, like um, what goes into the process of deciding like how to um, accomplish the particular goals that your client has or the particular work that you're going to be doing together? I think um, I'm, I just want to clarify. So we hear the term training oh. is used interchangeably with facilitation or a workshop. So we should clarify that training for us is teaching tools to facilitators and then a workshop is what a client might need for their team. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Because we we use those that language very particularly as well, um, yeah. and in the same way. So okay, cool. Yeah. So what goes into a training or a workshop? I guess <laughs> depending on whichever one you'd like to answer. I'll, I'll let you go ahead. Okay. So <clears throat> in most cases, I think people do see facilitation as well as um, as a training. You know, like they'll say, "Oh, we would like uh, you. We'd like you to come up and do a retreat, a training retreat." And then if we were really like saying, okay, what's the content? Uh, there isn't any. They want us to help them, you know, think faster and better. Or they want more innovation, that kind of thing. So what we say to people, and I'll, I'll use the city of Surrey, which is um, a wonderful client that we have that we work with a lot. And, um, and they wouldn't mind me telling this story because it's a really good one. Um, but they called and they said, could you come in? Because we, we have on our checklist that our – our new leaders all need innovation and creativity training. And so could you do, you know, like a four hour or two hour training workshop? And so we said, sure we could, but if we're gonna train you in that, why don't we solve a problem? Like pick a problem that you wanna work on and, and then we'll, we'll, we'll work on that while we're showing you um, how to get to innovation. And so they had to think about that for a while, then they came back to us and, um, this was last year. So last year we worked with them on land use and transition. So that's when like a contractor would buy land but not develop it. They just let it sit there and, you know, it collects garbage and, um, you know, the homeless people might move on to that property or, you know, drug users. It, it actually, you know, can become quite unsightly 
and attracts, let's say, a negative population, which causes problems for a community, you know, to have. So they were trying to figure out, you know, well, what do we do with land use and transition? So we went and worked on um, on that, along with perception of public safety. So those were two topics that we worked on first. Um, and we used our tools and techniques to show them how they could actually come up with some uh, ways to solve that problem. So we just facilitate a process, and then at the end of the day, they've got action items that they're going to that they're going to work with. So in most cases, people come to us with what we call a fuzzy problem. They have some kind of a problem. Um, they're not necessarily sure. It's usually problems that are the best are the chicken or egg problems, like poverty or um, not sure whether we should expand the business or leave it where it is right now or whether we should get into another product line. And so those fussy problems come to us and then we say to, we try to help them um, articulate the outcome. So what would you what would you like what would you like to get at the end of the day if we made, waved a magic wand, what would be perfect? Those kinds of questions in order to get them to tell us what uh, you know what's going on and we use a pre-consult, so we've got like a, a checklist we go through where we ask questions. Um, and then at the end of the day, what we do, once we know what their outcome is, is that we then have to figure out, you know, how many people are coming, how much time do we have, and then everything is always designed. So we design something to, um, to meet their needs. Yeah. 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 Jackie, you Jackie, you mentioned you mentioned problems. Problems. I'm going to meet you really. Just we got echo. I'll uh, y'all will have to unmute yourselves. I just muted you because I was hearing an echo. Um, you said fuzzy problems are your favorite problems. Is that yeah? Um, can you tell us about some times um, either one of you like in as you were learning and and honing your craft and facilitation, where you encountered a fuzzy problem and maybe didn't encounter it well, or you you didn't help like so. I guess what I'm looking for here is some some like reverse learning, like some things that you were like, oh, when I've got that fuzzy problem, the way that I tried to tackle it wasn't helpful. Because I think with a lot of people, um, learning from other people's mistakes might be helpful. Um, or here are some things I learned that that were not helpful in, in inviting a fuzzy problem. Does that make sense? All right, can you hear us? Yes, yes. thank you for having uh, me. Sorry about that. So maybe I'll jump in first. Um, so I think the really only experience I've had where there was a real fumble or a miss. Oh no. <laughs> Are we losing them again? It's always yep. between questions. It's so odd. Um, I, Google knows, man. I'm sorry, Steve, if you're still talking, we can't hear you. Oh. Um, I will say I was impressed by Steve saying he only has had one mishap. I was like, yeah, whoa. I wish. Yeah, I could, I could do hours of mishaps. I could do hours of mishaps just related to Legos, and I don't even use them in facilitation. Um, so I'm excited to hear about this one. Y'all, if you can hear us, will you? I'm sorry, but please like log out and log back in, or close the window and, and come back in again. Sam, do you, when they come back, uh, should we have them drop the bar? Okay. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Hello. <laughs> so we lost right when you started, Steve, and we were just talking about how close we are that you've got one. So we're excited to hear it. Um, do y'all think you could um, adjust bandwidth usage at the top? Um, if you drop it down to medium from auto HD, that might help with this issue. Um, so there's like the four little bars. And you how can do we do that? Down if you move your mouse over the person who's talking right now, um, up at the top, there'll be a bunch of little icons, and there are four bars click on those and drop it down a notch. Oh, OK. Oh, I see. OK, yeah. great. Yeah. All right. Super. We'll see. Maybe. Um, so y'all, actually, when it does that, it crops in, as you can probably see. I don't know if, if it would be comfortable if you could get a little closer. <laughs> if that's uncomfortable, this works. <laughs> Our chairs are battling for space, but that's there OK. There you go. That's <laughs> Perfect. We're we're gonna fingers crossed that this is the the fix. So, Steve, um, what was what was your one fumble? So, uh, I was in a learning environment and I was learning a creative problem solving application. And what the the big misstep was is I didn't have the right people in the room, so to speak. And so, 
I was practicing a tool and I had a problem owner and she was working on a personal problem. But what happened was because it was a personal problem and not necessarily applicable to everyone in that environment, they fell out of flow and they disengaged. So I think that when you're practicing something in that context, uh, you want to have the right people in the room. And I think that's applicable across the board. If you're working in an organization and you're trying to solve a problem in that organization, you need to make sure that the people who are coming have influence and it's within their scope. Um, so, you know, if you're working on something that has to do with marketing, well, you need to invite marketing. So, right. Yeah. For sure. And what, what advice would y'all have for either, I know that with a lot of facilitators, they struggle with getting the right people in the room. You know, sometimes it's like, oh, well, we're going to do this, but we're just going to give you the people that we have available. Like maybe not the high stakeholders or maybe not the marketing people. So what advice would you have for people who maybe can't get those folks in the room? Would you say it's don't do the facilitation or um, you could tweak it in certain ways? I think, okay, so this, we sometimes run into this. And so, um, and I think everyone does. I think that sometimes the decision maker is too busy. They're at the top of the organization and they just can't come. So one of the ways that we've gotten around it is to say, okay, well, we're going to go ahead. Um, the people in the room are going to, um, to do the best job that they can, knowing that that's a limiting factor. So everybody has to understand right from the get-go that this is what we're going to work on. And yes, the key person isn't here. They're not able to be here. Is everybody willing to continue? Because uh, I think it can be dehumanizing if you ask people to do all of this work and at the end of the day say, oh, well, guess what? Uh, it's, it's irrelevant. So one of the best ways to do it is to invite that decision maker in at the end of the day so that people can present back and then the decision maker can ask questions. So going into it, that's those are those are the um, almost the ground rules because the city of Surrey is an example. They wanted to, us to teach them how to do creative problem solving, and so when we said to them, "Okay, well, those are your problems. You want to work on safety and you want to work on land use. Who within this team has sway then to make some? Because key decisions are going to have to be made within the process to move forward. Who is it that has sway and can make that decision?" And so they invited them and they called them the champions. And so we had four champions in the room that were invited to the workshop. Um, it ended up being a, a three-day retreat. And those people were invited to the three-day retreat to use all the people that were there as a resource team in order to solve those problems. And so that was incredibly powerful. So we did it last April, and then we just did another one this April. And um, this time we worked on reduction of poverty. And uh, they actually allowed us to bring a, a film crew in, so we were able to film the whole thing, and we're making a short uh, documentary on the process, which is so, it's so cool. I'm just so excited uh, to have that together. That's, I, that's really cool, that, that uh, and, and that's kind of a, another question I'd love to get into, possibly, is, is how filming might change. Um, but before, before we get there, I, I really liked what you said about if a person can't be there to invite them in, even just at the end to get like presented out. I thought, I thought that was a really powerful idea and also calling them champions. I think anytime you can tell, tell people they're powerful and important, like they're like, oh, yes, I am. And like that really helps with the, with the relationship building in some way. Um, I, I think. I think that's really cool. And I, I'm wondering, are there any other things that you do when um, when the key people can't be there or ways in which you work with the group that is there to like empower them, but empower them like uh, to the place where they actually like without saying like, well, how would you solve this problem? Right. If you were the person in charge, that might feel like, but I'm not right. You might you might end up um, uh, creating some kind of uh, of gap that can't be filled. Is there any particular way you work with the folks that are there to ensure that they they feel like they can kind of own what's going on without feeling like they ultimately aren't the decision makers? How do you navigate that in balance? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Okay. So, um, so often, as Stephen alluded to, we have what we call a problem owner. And the problem owner, um, so two things. One, the problem owner 
can do a short presentation about all the five. It's a discovery stage where within the process, a discovery has to happen where somebody's reporting, these are the facts, this is what we know. Um, a fact could also be something that we don't know that we need to find out about. So that kind of, and then people can ask that person questions. So it's sort of a back and forth where um, sort of the expert you want to call them or the champion of the cause would really be telling people, this is the, this is the information that I have um, so that it's yeah. back and forth. But the champion comes into it by always saying, I don't have the answer. That's why I'm here. It's not a telling I'm not here to tell you, I'm here to ask you. So it's a real, um, it's a real asking process. So that's one thing we do. The other yeah. thing we, oh, sorry. Is that, and that's happening in the facilitation with the other participants? That's not happening between you and the problem owner, like pre-work? It depends on, okay, so there's a couple of ways to do this. Um, great okay. question. One way is you can tell people that they should have come to the facilitation already with all the facts, so they could already have sent a memo out, information could have gone out, everybody should be prepped. That need, that should happen anyway, but there's always a clarification uh, where we want to make sure that everybody, because a fact to me could be quite different than a fact to you. So we could hear the exact same fact, but I go in and I interpret it. I think it means this, and you mean think it means that, and then we don't have alignment. So that whole idea of doing some clarification around facts can be really powerful for people to be able to understand exactly what it is that um, that we're that we're talking about and that we're in agreement that we have some kind of basic understanding as much as you can in a verbal way before we start getting into the three dimensional, which is going to continuously clarify everything anyway. And then one other thing I wanted to just mention that we do is if there is a decision maker or a champion and they're not going to be able to come to the meeting, but they're coming at the end to be reported back to, we do not allow any in or out of the room. So if you're in the room, you're in the room for the long haul, you can't come in and go out and come in and go out. And we do that to level the playing field. We don't have any observers. If you're in the room, you're playing. If you're in a playroom, you're going to play, and everybody builds, everybody makes stuff, everybody does everything we do, um, and that's really to keep the room safe and to keep the playing field level. How, how do, like, I couldn't agree more with you on that, like, idea, like, that intuitively makes sense to me. If some, but again, like, uh, that doesn't necessarily make sense to other people, even other facilitators, but definitely to other participants. The idea, like, I don't, I have a thing I need to do for half an hour. Like, why can't I come back in? Is, is there a way that you explain that to folks? Or is there a way that you, like, communicate, like, this is why it has to be a continuous group. And if you leave, that's fine, but you can't come back. Like, how do you explain that to folks? Do you want me to show you what I do? I can show you a diagram that I do. Okay, and great. We totally, we totally own this one. Like we do it with people, and there's no then, um, there's no kind of answering back. So right. no so, conversation. Okay, so I'm going to turn the screen. I'll, if you want to go to the flip chart, I can angle it for you. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to show you on the flip chart what we do, okay. and Stephen's going to angle the camera over the flip chart. All right. Love it. Co-facilitation at work here, y'all. That's right. <laughs> okay. How's that? Can you see my flip chart? Yeah. All right. I've got stuff underneath here, so um, I just have to. I've got a uh, chisel tip marker over I've here. I've got one here, too. Okay. So, so I start off by saying I draw this picture, which is a circle. Can you see that? Yep. Okay, and I draw these little circles around here. And then I say, um, how many people have been to a meeting and thought that was a complete waste of my time? So we start with that, yeah, okay. And that's what people do. It doesn't matter what country we're in. So we were in 11 countries last year. Start with this. How many people were in a meeting and said that was a complete waste of time? So now I'm going to ask you, just like I would if I was standing in front of a group, Okay, so tell me something that happens in that meeting that's a complete waste of time. What's happening? People are on their phones or they're distracted. 
Okay, so somebody's here, you know, they're kind of, they're looking at their handheld. Okay, what else is happening? Uh, there's like side conversation that not the whole, that like doesn't need to happen. Right, there's like sidebars. Okay, what else is happening? People are sharing things that aren't relevant for the rest of the group. Yeah, like just talking about stuff, yeah. whatever, okay? <laughs> oh, I like this. Uh, people are there who don't need to be there. Yeah, so there's somebody that's like, I don't even know why I'm here. And maybe they're like, oh my God, this is so boring. Okay, what else? It could have been an email. It didn't need to be interactive. Yes, yeah, so we could have got a memo on this yeah. whole thing and we didn't even need to come. Yeah, so we should have got a memo. Okay, but there's no memo. And so here we are at this meeting wondering why we're here. Okay, okay. what else happens at this meeting that's a waste of time? People come late. Yeah, people come late, or they come and leave and come and leave, which was your question, um, Meg. So you got the guy that gets up, and so he goes out, and then he comes back, and then he says, what's everyone talking about? And then the meeting stops, and then everybody has to tell him what was they were talking about, which is probably nothing, because <laughs> it's going in circles, right? Okay, okay, yeah. And then there's this guy that does all the talking, you know him or her, that just goes on and on and on, and it goes nowhere. Um, okay, what are some of the other ones, Stephen? So, and then, you know, this person actually could be talking on top of this person, so just really two people are doing all of the talking. So basically what we end up with here is a thinking stew, and there's usually no outcome. So what people really want to see is some kind of a checklist that we've got stuff done, and a decision has been made, and everyone knows what we're doing. That's what people want, but there's none of that. That's like a big circle. That is not happening. Okay, so I start my meetings off with this, and then we say, um, how many people want to have a meeting like this today? <laughs> none. Right. Nobody. Yeah. And then I often will ask people, on your agenda, on or sorry, on your budget, what is the most expensive line item? And in most cases, it's wages. Human resources. But then right. I make the point that if we're having meetings like this, and we know we are across the country having meetings like this, then we're wasting probably one of the most valuable resources, which is all of these people and all of their time. And so then that we lead to how many people are willing to have a meeting today that doesn't look like this meeting? And so everybody says, yes, they're willing. So at this point, what I'm doing here is I'm preempting all of the behaviors that they oh no y'all we just lost you again is that meg did you lose them yep <laughs> jackie we just lost you again right at preempting the behaviors i don't know what's this has never happened with google hangout this is a new problem so um we're not sure how to fix it um but it does seem that logging out and logging back into the link works i don't know if y'all can hear us during this part um jackie, when they come back yeah, we'll ask them when they come back. We need to facilitate this process. Um, if you can, you're probably getting good at logging out, logging back in. I I love this idea. Um, and okay, cool. So they're coming back in. Okay. All right. Can you hear us? Yes. So really quick, can y'all hear us when we're um, uh, talking and you can't hear, or we can't hear you, but can you hear us? No, when it freezes, we don't hear or see anything. It's just, okay. yeah. Cool, okay. Okay. So at the end of that picture, I just I just asked them, um, how many people want to have a different kind of meeting? And everybody says they do. And so what I've done by drawing that circle is preempting any kind of an argument for the next thing I'm going to tell them, which is that we have these ground rules. And so the ground rules are no electronics, Trust the process because they don't know what we're going to be doing with them. Everybody builds. Tell your story. Listen generously. Question the model. Be on time. Be on time. Um, have hard fun and stay in flow. Somebody was just walking into our office. So we had <laughs> <laughs> Jackie, all of those are all of those are ground rules that I've seen before, except have hard fun. What's that one? Ah, this one. Well, we have that one on there because with the Lego, one of the points that we want to make 
is that it's going to be hard work and that they can have fun but that they um, that it's serious because once we had and we actually added that on there because we had a team of people that were like this is so much fun and they really just wanted to keep playing and fooling around and we had to keep bringing them back to the outcome that we were working on so we added hard fun and when I get to the hard fun one I'll say to people you know this is going to be fun but it's not just play for play sake we're actually playing with a purpose because we need to get to the end to the outcomes and so once I do this then we just say is everybody okay to follow the ground rules if they say yes so I make sure that everyone says yes so the one that's hard is no electronics and on this one I'll say to people okay if you have to take a phone call or because we have worked in hospitals where they absolutely have to be yep. and so what we just say is how about for today then we have the agreement that you turn your phone to silent and if you have to take the call you go up and you can take the call and everything in here stops oh. unless they're building if people are like building with the Lego and the music is on we'll just keep playing the music and we'll give them more time to build but if we're the, at the storytelling part of the process everything stops Jackie, uh, I yeah, that's really helpful. Meg and I have facilitated in hospitals as well, where the no electronics rule just doesn't work. So I love that y'all. I like that way of it, dealing with it, though. We haven't tried that. Um, I'm wondering. So you added that rule based on that um, experience you noticed. Have there been any ground rules you've removed because they were eliciting an outcome that you weren't happy with? Like, has that list been um, shortened as well as lengthened? We're, we're changing it all the time. This is the one I just had for this last thing that we just did. Um, so we're often we often will put things on there. So there's a different be difference for us between rules and etiquette as well. And so etiquette is really also we establish that quite early in the um, in the session. And etiquette speaks more to um, group norms. Uh, yeah, group norms and establishing group norms. And once we establish them in the morning, it doesn't matter. Whenever people get us, they still follow. The, they almost like know that we're going to do it, take turns and that people are going to listen to each other. Um, we changed the rule about listening to listen generously because we found that there's a big difference between listening and getting ready to talk. And so we actually give an example of what we mean by listening generously. Uh, so that was one that we kind of added. Can you tell us what that example is? Because I, I couldn't agree more. That is a huge difference. What's the example that you use? I, I just asked how many people use fake listening and then, <laughs> and then I, I say fake listening is when someone's talking to you and you're going like this and then they ask a clarifying question and you realize you were not listening <laughs> and people admit to it they were like I, how many people fake listen actually I don't even give the example I just say how many people here use fake listening and most people put their hand up like I think you know, we think that children, we're often saying to children, oh, you know, children don't listen. Adults are absolutely the worst listeners <laughs> because we just have so many, you know, monkeys of the mind going on all the time that to actually slow down, focus on what someone's saying to you. I mean, Stephen and I do it. You know, we joke around with each other all the time, but we'll just say to each other, I wasn't listening. Well, you know, your brain goes on a mind vacation and that's okay too. You know, just own it. This is how our how our, our brains work. And I think that we're just um, you know, we'll just say to each other, okay, can you can you say all of that again? Because I I just went somewhere else. So yeah. Because the Google Hangout froze and we didn't hear anything you said. <laughs> um, are there we were me and Sam were talking about this yesterday a little bit, and I'm wondering, are there any ground rules or etiquette things that you two do between like when you're co-facilitating with each other are there any things that you're like okay like we are okay with interruptions but we don't want the group to interrupt uh, each other are there any changes or norms you have between you that you would not want to see mirrored in the group I think that when you're facilitating you really want to be showing best practices and I'm really conscious when you know Jackie's facilitating that I'm engaged and even if it's a discussion that we've had before let's say in one of our trainings I do my very best to show up and and be you know showing people really the behavior that they should be modeling 
Because if I'm on my cell phone, there's nothing more distracting than someone who's distracted. And I tell people, if I pick my phone up, like, and we'll actually physically, like I'll say to Stephen, Stephen, can you set a timer on your phone? Or Stephen, can you uh, take that picture and let's tweet it out? So I'm really clear that we're going to use technology in a small way. Um, but what we're not, and I, you know, if people are like dying to take pictures of their Lego, we totally let them. And we just make a joke. We say, oh, well, make sure you tweet it or put it on Facebook and tell everyone how great we are. So we'll make a joke like that. Um, but then we're like, okay, phone's away now. But they want, they do want to take pictures of stuff, so we, we let them do that. What we're watching for is to make sure that people aren't text messaging or Snapchatting um, or out of flow is what we call it. Right. That makes sense. So y'all, earlier you mentioned that one of the, the goals or, or one of the challenges is that people might have a fact and there's two different ways of looking at that fact. And one of the challenges or one of your initial goals is aligning the facts, making sure that you're on the same page of what that fact is. I'm guessing, and maybe I'm wrong, um, but there are some ways that you can uniquely do that using Lego that you might not be able to do um, if you don't have those in the room. Am I seeing a nod? Yeah. Yeah, can you explain a way that you would use Legos in that in that setting of like helping people align the facts or like a game or an activity that might help? Because that's a problem a lot of facilitators encounter. Um, and I'm curious to hear how you challenge that or how you um, overcome that challenge. Okay, so the Lego is really interactive and we haven't actually talked about the, there's five steps to yeah. how the Lego works. Um, so the steps are, and these are repeated over and over and over again throughout the day, is that the facilitator would give a direction or pose a question or um, ask people to build something. So it's really, could you build a model um, about, and it's some kind of a question, and then once they build it, then people then the, the next stage so step one i'll just do the five steps first so step one is um the facilitator asks a question and puts a challenge forward um it and it, it's a direction so it's very directive play and it's can you build blah blah, blah. then the person would start constructing so they start putting the lego together they start building something as they do it uh so the so the second step is constructing the third step is they start metaphor they start thinking metaphorically about what the Lego represents. So each brick um, can mean something in their model that they build, and they start thinking about what the meaning could be. And then in the fourth step, we ask them to tell their story. So after they built yeah. it, then we we turn take and we hear everyone's story at the table. So that's step number four. The fifth step. Um, there's two parts to the fifth step. We could actually even make the six steps, but the fifth, the fifth step is reflection and questioning. And so it's an incubation process. So after somebody builds something and then they tell their story, even during the story, something else might emerge for them. Um, or it could emerge that I built something and then Stephen asked me a question about my model and I answered the question and it's in answering the question that I have new understanding and I'm sharing some kind of insight. Um, so those are the five steps. So and the, um, the incubation part two happens rapidly between the builds because if I build something, I tell my story and then and now I'm looking at Steven and he's explaining his story. And then, you know, we go to, to three other people at the table and we listen to their stories. Then when I come back to my story, I might actually think or notice something different because you can't hold an entire story in your head. You can't like rehearse it and practice it. And so you end up saying something that's unique and different every time. Is, is there a, is there, so I was, I like, as you were saying all of that, I was like already being like, Ooh, what are ways, like, what are like questions I could ask or what are things that I could do in my, in my workshops? So my question for you is, is there a question is there a limit to the abstractness of a question? Like when you said like the first, like, you know, a model, like build a model and then some directive question. Is there like, don't go so abstract with a question or don't go so literal? Um, is there any parameters you would, you would give to me if I was like, how, 
like how abstract can I go with a question or how big can I go with a question? Any like suggestion guidelines on that? Yes. So I'm thinking within the framework of uh, Lego serious play. And I think that there's two things that comes to mind. Um, the first thing is going for the target too soon. And that's, uh, you as a facilitator have a, you've got a question that you want answered and that might be uh, the outcome of the workshop. And if you go for it too soon, people might not be ready for the answer. They may not know it or they, they want to fill the space and they'll give you an answer that's an easy answer to come up with. Um, and so I think that uh, going, I think that you really want to structure your questions going from, um, literal and concrete and then working iteratively to more abstract as people are getting warmed up and you as a facilitator really need to know um, what those steps are as you're going forward and I think that comes down to practice and testing your design for a workshop. Um, totally. And I think there's a, there's a real, um, you know, and we, we, we really drill this in our, in our training. doesn't necessarily mean that people um, take it to heart. I think often people have to go try it and then they realize, okay, that didn't work. Uh, but if you go for the target too soon, if you ask the key question, so think about it like you're unpeeling an onion. If you go for the center of the onion before you've actually taken some of the layers off, as Stephen said, you know, people don't like to say, I don't know. And if you ask a question, they'll give you an answer. And then just the way our brains work, um, that actually can do more harm than good because we like to hang on to things that we say even when you know it's hard to be wrong and so if I say the wrong thing then I might just put a whole lot of effort into making that true so that I don't have to say oh I maybe I you know I I I, I did I, I didn't know or um, it's kind of that whole process of unlearning yeah. and so I think that when people say oh well it's this then they put way too much energy into making that true, and um, you know. And sometimes, if they're if we if we think they have an answer that they have as a canned answer, like you know, why? What's the problem with poverty? What's the reason why people are suffering in poverty? You know, if somebody comes up with an, a quick a quick answer. Um, they're also actually attaching those neurons in their brain to make that answer even more true, and so for them it becomes truer than true. And it's really hard to get people to let go and change their mind about things when you, when even your question has reinforced that. Um, so we're pretty, we're pretty careful about that, and we don't want to ask key questions until late in the workshop. After we've really opened people's minds up, we've really got them into the the state that we want them in, which is the play flow state, and that's where we're then going to. They lose track of time when we take them down into this kind of a journey. Um, and that's where we get all the great information, is yeah. what we get there. So we go slow in the beginning to go fast in the end. I think there, there was so much that was like resonating with me, and I, I can see with Sam too. Um, uh, 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 yeah, I, I just, I love that piece too of like, if you ask a question too early, you're actually getting in the way of a good answer that could come later. And, and it looked like, Sam, you had a question that you wanted to ask on that, so. Yeah. Uh, I'll stop. Okay. So uh, circling us back, that that uh, that that is incredibly helpful context, and I think I I um, might already know the answer to this question. But in what ways do you use that process for the aligning the facts specifically? Like, in what ways do you see that, like, on the more micro level for solving that initial problem? How does that work? So when people, so we we wouldn't actually say, could you use a Lego and build all the facts? We wouldn't say that. We would say um, something. It might sound more like a question that might say, okay, so we live here in Whistler, um, Whistler, British Columbia, Canada, which is I think just north of you, Meg. Mm -hmm. um, so, but we might say something like, let's say we had a community workshop and everybody from the community came here. We might say to them a question that would be like, "What? what is um, the next big thing for Whistler? First of all, that we would have them build a model of, and, and modify it and make it about Whistler. So they might build some mo model and say, you know, Stephen might say, well, Whistler's all about mountain biking. 
And I might say, well, Whistler's all about, you know, skiing, or I might say Whistler's all about vacation. So right away, we have kind of like a different idea. We're both right. Everyone has a different story, but their stories are all correct. Um, then I might start saying, well, what do you think the biggest challenge is for the people that live in Whistler, being a resort town? What do you think the biggest challenge is? And uh, Stephen might build, well, the groceries are too expensive. And I might build something that says, well, you know, the roads are plugged and you can't get into town when it's really busy. So each of us might have another fact that also could be true. But as Stephen is telling his story about the fact, and I'm telling my story about the fact, all we're doing is we're saying these are all the facts. So we're really unearthing all this information. I mean, Lego series play it, the actual truest sense of the word you could say is a communication tool, but it's an absolutely fantastic research tool because you're researching information by asking people questions and the more answers you get, the better because all of them can be true. Just because Stephen's fact is different than my fact doesn't mean I'm right and he's, he's wrong. We're both right in a different way. Yeah. I think that one of the real beautiful benefits of Lego Serious Play is that people can be aligned in disagreement. And so what Jackie is saying is that we can have two very different um, perspectives and we don't have to have consensus. We don't have to figure, we don't have to come to the same conclusion. We don't have to look at things the exact same way. And it's that saying, I don't have to have my way as long as I have my say. And I think that people really need to be seen, heard, and understood. And as long as we're able to honor what people are saying and share what we're thinking, um, I think that that's a really powerful experience for people and so is, a, is a perfect tool. What are, are there any ways that you see that, like that Lego is uniquely good at that? Because like, I, you know, I don't know, there's so many instances where I can imagine, right, people, the, uh, the idea of people being able to be like, your truth is your truth, my truth is my truth, and we are both on board with that is like, whoo, that is a beautiful place to have people be in. So is there any, what is the way that like Lego allows that to uniquely shine? Okay, so that, so this is where I can get almost evangelical about it. <laughs> Because this is what Lego does better than any other tool. And I think really when we looked at tools, you know, we've got we've got cases of tools, but the Lego for us just was the stickiest one because of this because of this point. So Stephen Milt builds a small model and it means something about I'll go back to groceries are too expensive. And I build a model and mine is about the fact that traffic is too congested. Um, eventually we're going to build all of these things together and this is where we have to collaborate but better than that I'm just gonna step backwards too and I'm just gonna use this little model I have here I've got like a little a little duck here so I say to Steven um, you know I built this model and it's a duck and so then I say to Steven you know can't you see it's a duck it's got like an eye and it's yellow and it's red and there's a beak and this is a duck and now Stephen isn't going to say, no, it's not. That isn't a duck. That's just a bunch of yellow and red Lego. Stephen is going to agree with me that that's a duck because I said it's a duck. And that's actually one of the um, philosophies that makes this work, that if I say that's an elephant, everybody then is going to agree that it's an elephant. So all of a sudden, whatever this model is, but then when I talk about it, I can pick it up and I can show it to Stephen and he can look at it. And then if we want to talk about this elephant or this duck, later on, we can both talk about the duck instead of it being about me. It's about this thing on the table that I built that I talked about. And so then all of a sudden, instead of it being, you know, only you and your team or you and your truth would go do whatever, it becomes about if only we could take, you know, this eye off and maybe put it on a different way. And then we have a conversation about what that would look like if we changed it. Then what would it be? And so it's a really great way to get people to collaborate. And it's not necessarily consensus building, but it's one common story that we can all live with and we agree with. And that's really what we want when we're talking about alignment. Um, I think also, too, when we're making decisions about going forward, sometimes it it happens that one person after the whole day thinks we should do one thing and one person after the whole day thinks we should do another thing 
we are able to work with people in a way that they've gotten to such a point of what we call differentiation where I can understand what you're saying, you can understand what I'm saying, that at that point, people actually work it out themselves. We almost don't need to facilitate anymore. And they'll say, okay, well, why don't we try that idea for six months, we'll test it, we'll measure it, we'll come back and we'll look at it, and then we can try this other idea. Or maybe we can run both things at the same time and we can measure and test. So people get to a point where um, we, we actually, by setting the ground rules up and using the philosophy that we're going to start using, we make the room um, so much more um, safer for people to disagree, but in a good way, so that people can collaborate and we get to differentiation where the work is done, and then people will, will actually feel so validated in the process that they're willing to give and take a little bit more. How, I, <laughs> there are so many questions, again, but I am so stuck on this idea, and you probably saw, like, in my in my eyes, are just like so stuck on how how important is the idea that you can separate the fact physically from the person who brought the fact in, like, and and when you see that happening, um, is that something that just really like is that something that you you don't even have to facilitate? You just notice that it's the duck. It's not Jackie's duck. Now it's a duck. Right. Um, how important That's is that? Aspect? It's it's paramount, and it's also it's fascinating how quickly people fall into that as being a norm. And I think that, so Jackie touched on it at the end of what she, her last point was the safety of the Lego. And as soon as my idea is represented physically, then it's no longer about me and my idea. It's about this physical piece of plastic that's sitting in front of us. And now it's really safe to discuss. Uh, so I was watching a podcast last night and um, a brilliant gentleman is talking about uh, lost civilization in uh, Turkey, I believe. And so there's, he has a couple of books that are fascinating, Fingerprints of the Gods and Mag Magicians of the Gods. And so people are, are, are now attacking him personally. So scientists are not, they're not talking about the scientific backgrounds of his concepts. They're now attacking him personally and it's, it's not safe and it's really quite hurtful. And if they had a better medium to be talking about concepts, then it, it really cuts down on the personal attacks because now it's about the idea and you can discuss it versus the person and, and maybe their thinking style or their approach. Oh, I bet. Are there specific, do you notice like, so in the, maybe the first few like build and, and discuss the first few iterations of that process, do you notice people um, struggling with that and being like, well, Jackie's duck would be better if blank? Or, go ahead, Jackie, yeah. Um, we, okay, so right from the beginning, um, the very first activity we do is really quite benign. So it's just really, no one's gonna argue with it because it's just really benign. And so in there, we have like teachable moments. So when you asked about the training part, uh, the teachable moments are really, about mindset versus I'm going to teach you content about something. It's more about so it's so a so a teachable moment would be like great. Everybody built a model and look, everybody's model is different. So one of the one of the things that we do is we give everybody um, this much Lego to start with. So it's like a little bag of Lego. It's put together purposely to be creative. And so we uh, the first thing we do is everybody builds a tower. And so we give them a, you know, two minutes. Everybody build a tower and put the minifigure on the tower. And then we'll say, we just do this activity every time. We'll say, okay, and are there two towers that are exactly the same? Well, there never are because you can make so many different combinations with the Lego. And then we'll switch over and we'll say, okay, so the towers are all different, but you had the same material, the same amount of time. Everybody built something different. So let's do a check. Who thought we were going for height? Who thought that the tower, when we said tower, we really meant it should be high? And then we might ask a question, how many people thought we wanted it, you know, when you were building your tower, you were focusing on it being strong and you didn't want it to fall apart. And then, you know, those are the people that were like looking for stability. And then we'll say, who was going for, had to make it even? Who wanted the red one and then the green one? And then you get those people. And then who was going for some cool design? And then we make the point, wow, everyone made something different. We all had a minute. Everybody built something completely different. 
Um, and what happens when you get a memo that tells everybody to do something and everybody reads a memo and goes off in the workplace and does something completely different? And this is really getting now to diversity of thinking. So we spend a lot of time in organizations, you know, uh, the HR department are really big on diversity of culture and, um, and diversity of the people that work that work in the organization, but they don't necessarily get into the fact that there's a diversity of how we think. So that also plays a role. Um, so two very, very similar people that have the same job could think about things so differently, and that's actually, that's the thing that makes us brilliant, and it's also the thing that tears us apart. Sure. Can I, can I ask a, uh, so, one of the things that I'm interested in, and we've, we've asked a couple other people, is how they learn about a group from the like get-go, from the like, from your first and early interactions with them. And for one guest, they were like, when I ask for a volunteer, I see how long it takes for people to volunteer or how many people volunteer. And that signals to me so much about a group. Is there anything that you're looking for in your first like early interactions with a group or are you like, ooh, that person like won't literally like feels like there's a, like a, a right way to do everything, and that I'm I'm you know like watching them build and and like trying to build a, an understanding of the group that we're working with. Are there any like little ways that you all look for those insights into a group in your early interactions with them? Well. I think uh, Jackie and I are always keeping a very close eye on people's behavior, and I think that if you're if you're paying attention, you can you can pick up on things really quickly. And we're always reading between the lines. You know, communication is so little of it is verbal, and so much of it is body language and tone and delivery. Is there anything in particular you look for, Stephen? Or like, because I, I feel like as a facilitator, you get more practiced at that. But if somebody was like, I hear I'm supposed to read my group and I don't know what that means. Like, is there any little things that you'd be like, look out, I look out for this, or I know that I notice these things happening? I think people being resistant and grouchy. Um, so, I mean, there's lots of that in organizations, and within the framework of LEGO Serious Play, people get on board. So a question we get in our training all the time for facilitation is, or for facilitators, I should say, is, you know, what do you do if somebody doesn't want to build? Well, it's one of the ground rules that everybody agrees to. So we, we have all these safeguards in place, and so... You know, we're, we're looking for resistance, but then we're all also able to preempt it. And I think that a really big pitfall is that when you have one person that's quite negative, that you pour all your energy into that person, and that's and that just feeds the beast. Or if you have a table of people, let's say you have a, a large room, maybe 35 people that you're facilitating, or however big it is, you know the negativity will just go to that one point in the room, and then you really you need to break tables up as soon as you pick up that say one table isn't following your process, no matter what you're doing as a facilitator, you need to, you need to nip that in the bud immediately and, and just mix up the energy. Maybe you need to do a, an icebreaker or some kind of an energizer and activity and then say, okay, so now we're going we're gonna to mix up the tables a little bit and then everyone's going to grow on and that's just kind of the way it goes. So you, you, know, you have fun and just don't get sucked into the negativity, I think. And... Um, I, I, hopefully that, that's answered your question. Yeah, for sure. I think a lot of times that people, and people are grouchy, and often for good reason. You know, like some of these places where, where they work, it's not a supportive thing, and they've done lots of facilitations in the past where they've gone to off-sites, and it's, not, um, it's not, been, not been great, and they've sat there thinking, that was a waste of my day. I've got real work back at the office. And so I think that when people come in the room, they don't know us. We, you know, they've never met us before. So one of the things I always, I, I always say is that you should assume everyone's going to be resistant right from the beginning, and then just get over it. Because if you're there, your job is really um, to to work with people. I mean, when I used to work in in corrections, none of the people that came to see me really wanted to see me. They had to, 
And so I, so people would say, how do you work with resistance? And I was like, every single day I work with resistance. In fact, the opposite is like to think that people come to you because they want to is, un, you know, that was unusual to me. And so I would think, well, if people come to see me, my job then is to, um, is to, I don't want to say win them over because I hate that expression, but it's really my job to lead and to show them a new way. And so one of the things that we'll do is if we know that we have a resistant crowd, um, we'll break, like Stephen said, we'll break up the tables because grouchy people will sit with other, you know, they all would like to sit with their friends and they all like the table in the back and we know what they're going to do. They're just going to, they're going to sit back there and they're going to complain. And so we will mix up the tables and we'll do it with some kind of a fun activity. And then once the tables are mixed up, we can break that pattern. And it's very difficult to be the only person um, that's kind of in a bad mood. The other thing that we do all the time is we use humor. And it's not, it's not staged humor. It's both Stephen and I, are we both love to laugh and we like to have fun at work as well. And so when we're facilitating, um, Stephen, will, Stephen, it's usually Stephen teasing me because I've usually done something that I wasn't <laughs> listening or something. And so, so we'll do something and then I just laugh at myself and people love to be in on the joke. And so if this humor, people will pay attention. They're like, what did she say or what did she do? But starting the activity too with drawing on the flip chart and, and drawing that picture People cannot take their eyes off me. When I go up there and I do that circle and I start drawing, I, you don't even have to know how to draw. You just like scribble pictures. But people are, I did this with an MBA class. I, I started it by drawing that picture. And I looked at them and all like 35 students are eyes on me while I'm drawing the picture. And that would never happen if any other you know, professors talking, everyone's like going through their bags and getting out their phones and writing notes and, you know, doing whatever. But as soon as you go up there and you start drawing a picture, all eyes are on you. And I think that gets the whole thing started. Um, we also use music and we, they know we've got Lego. So they're a little offside, you know, right from the beginning. They're like, oh, what are these people doing with the Lego? Um, and we open it with a really fun activity that they laugh at. And we get it going from there. So we just keep building on the momentum. It's almost like a show, you know. It starts off, people are like, oh, what's this going to be about? And then we keep going up, up, up. And then at the end of the day, we want them to clap and hug us. That's our whole goal. I think, oh, go ahead, Deep, yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, you know, we always say that people listen to the radio station, WIFM, what's in it for me? <laughs> and I think as soon as as soon as their song comes on, they're happy, and their song is really talking about themselves. You have to answer, why am I here, and why is this applicable to to me? And so, no matter whatever your your session is, you know, you, you have to really answer that for every person in the room. Yeah. Within about the first twenty minutes, like within that first twenty minutes, they have to go, uh oh, these people kind of get us, and this is going to be different and all of those kinds of things. And that's what we really, we definitely do that. Right. Um, I have a question that takes us in a very like different direction. Sam, is there anything you wanted to like build off of or <laughs> now I'm using that word and hearing it differently. Um, but uh, yeah, before I just like throw my, no, I have a very similar question. So I'm curious to hear where yours is and maybe we'll still have time for mine or we'll just build on yours. Go ahead. Okay. So my question, and it again takes us in a, yeah, just a different place, is do you all use Legos internally to plan or to like create the, or to like generate ideas or to like any of it? Do you use Legos in your planning process or like internally as an organization? Never. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Oh, you outed us. No, of course we, we use it for everything. So, um, so we have a lot of Lego here and we have a lot of fun with the Lego doing, I mean, we're, we do fun stuff with it all the time. Uh, but we use it because we can see the value of, of creating a landscape and moving things around. So one of the, one of the things that, um, that we know is that when you've got, we'll call these artifacts. We'll say these are these aren't ducks anymore. This is just a, this is a piece of Lego that tells some kind of a story 
that we agreed upon and, and we built it. And maybe we built it together. Maybe, you know, C built this one, I built this one, and then we actually, we broke the ones we built to make something completely new, okay? So it doesn't even look like what it used to look like. Now it's just completely a new thing that represents a whole different idea, which is super cool because in the process of us breaking it apart and changing it, we now have a new thing and we've actually forgotten about the old thing because we have this new story. And so the new story that's represented in a physical object actually represents what we were thinking a minute and a half ago because we built it a minute and a half ago and we had to think about it to do it. So once we have that, then this whole idea that we can move it around and we can see how things interchange and connect, that creates um, a 3D object that we can have a conversation about that's easier than just writing things down on a flip chart. I mean, there's some things, we use flip charts too, we use post-it notes, and sometimes we'll very quickly, if we know the answers and it's just like a brain dump when we're getting stuff out. But if we're stumped by something and we're not really sure, we'll build it and then we can use it to talk about. And that's that's really what we teach people to do. Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna piggyback on this too. And so Jackie and I have two very different thinking styles. And so I'm very I'm very concrete and I like things very dogmatic and step by step. And Jackie's very conceptual and has, you know, it's just an idea generating machine. And so for me to understand the things that she's talking about, I really need a physical model, something that I can look at so that then I can build um, a framework in my mind. So when people are talking to me, I'm always I'm imagining and creating and picturing things in my head so that I can kind of integrate their thinking. And so with the Lego, I don't, I don't have to do that because I can look at their concept and then immediately I can understand and I can question different elements of it. And so when we're doing our internal strategy, we, we have to use Lego. I mean, there's, there's really no other way to do it. Awesome. You were talking about the, the allocations of the little baggies, um, like the build bags or, or um, you know, those. Uh, when in a facilitation or in a workshop, you're giving everybody the exact same. They have the same bricks, um, the combinations of the same bricks. Is that, yeah? When you are working internally, do you just have a pile of Lego in the middle of the table? Yeah, is that generally? Okay. We just dump it out because we've already done what we call skill building and we don't we don't need to redo it. So the little bag, um, these are perfect because you've got to remember a lot of the people that we work with have maybe never even seen Lego before. And so it's not too overwhelming. It's just a small amount. It's enough to get started. Um, but for us, we, you know, sometimes Stephen will have an idea and he'll actually go just a minute. He'll run in the back and I'll hear him digging through a box and then he'll come out with some piece of Lego that's like, this is it. So I think that for us, we are, um, we're using it all the time. So we're kind of a little bit different that way. But going into a workshop, we always start with the small bags. If we've been in, a, in a, with the same group over and over again, they're at that same point where we can just dump Lego on the table and um, they'll just rifle through it looking for what they need. Cool, okay, so that's that's kind of what I was assuming. Now I'm wondering, so a lot of the work that Meg and I do is not just about diversity of thought, which is something you were mentioning before, but about the effects of power on the ability to um, enact that diversity or, or the ways that power can affect people's ability to thrive or, or be seen or be, be, be recognized. and I'm thinking about the fact that everybody gets the same bags as um, a very equitable way to start that conversation. And I'm wondering if you've ever experimented with a very inequitable way to start that conversation, like given some participants a bag with two pieces and said build a tower and some participants a bag with 100 pieces to build a tower. Um, and I'm wondering if, if you've experimented with that inequity in the beginning, um, does that result in like uh, helpful conversations? Would you discourage that? Um, what do you think? I think it really depends. We have an activity that we do that highlights uh, inequality at work, and it's more around favoritism. And I think that it, you know, for some cultures it doesn't work because it's not a very safe activity. Um, it, it's, yeah, people. It could be upsetting depending on who your who your crowd is. Um, but it really depends on how you're theming your workshop. You know, if you're talking about 
if, if the organization you're working in, that's a, a major problem for that, then you should, you should address it. But then you also kind of have to know your crowd. Is it going to be safe? Are people going to be upset? Are they going to be able to recover from it? Um, yeah, so I guess the answer is it depends. But we do have an activity that we, we employ. We actually, have a, we actually have a couple, so you're thinking about the group. Yeah. The other one that we have is, um, is Stephen and I invented this activity, and it's really, it uses the Lego, um, and it, there's a number of iterations where people have like a kit of Lego, mm. and they have something that they have to build as a team. <coughs> But we have different rules going for different teams all the time. And we play this game where we're, you know, Stephen pretends he's on the cell phone and he's not doing what he's supposed to be doing. So we actually mimic what it might look like in a work environment. And then people can change the rules. So they get the power to change our rules. Um, but we run these iterations and it's all around um, efficiencies and effectiveness. And we use a Lego to do it because it's really a cool, a cool activity. But it's really always in the debrief afterwards where we um, spend time thinking about how is this the same or different than something that might happen in the workplace and what were the outcomes and the learning from doing that and you know what, what could we change. So it's really around those activities. But we created it pur purposely because we – we know that in organizations, there's a lot of dysfunctional rules um, that people don't even know why it's a rule. It's a rule, we're going to follow it, but we don't know why. And then we also have all this bad behavior around the rule because we think the rule's a dumb rule, and so then we don't follow the rule. So I'll give you an example of, of this whole thing, which is quite interesting. Um, so we do quite a bit of work in hospitals. And there's signs everywhere that say, don't talk on your cell phone because, you know, it interrupts with the equipment, you know, the, the life-saving equipment. And then you, you look and you see some doctor walking by with their cell phone, right? And so then people are like, well, that's a dumb rule because, look, you know, doctors can be on their cell phone. Or the other rule that, you know, you're not supposed to wear, wear shoes that have, like, an open back. And so then people are like, okay, well you know, I'm going to do it anyway, or I'm going to wear a sandal that has a small strap, or they think of a way to break the rule because they think that's a dumb rule. But then there could be some really important rules like no smoking near an oxygen tank. And so people then don't know which is a rule they should follow, which is a rule that they shouldn't follow. And since we're going to make up the rules anyway until somebody stops them, it creates an environment that's completely unsafe. So that's just using a hospital example, but there's so many examples in, in lots of different workplaces where you know, a rule has been in place and then nobody knows why and people either, you know, don't use common sense anymore because they want to follow the rule or they just break the rules to meet their own needs and then, um, and then you have conflict. Right. Uh, when you said, like, we give them a, a thing and then they can specifically change the rules, I was like, oh, like, there's so many new possibilities to that, like, with any activity, like, um, to be able to empower people, like, did, were the restrictions we gave you, like, unintelligent, unintelligible, or just, like, problematic to your goal? Okay, change the rules. And, like, I just think that's a magical tool, like, that makes a ton of sense, particularly within, like, they can really understand how it would manifest with Legos, right? Like, how you could give them different specific rules around the build that would be like, oh yeah, of course it would be easier if we remove that rule. But it's such a like beautiful metaphor launching point, which I was just like feeling really inspired by. So I think that's awesome. Um, oh, man, I have so many questions. Um, but I, I guess the, the question I have, so the, the little baggie that you have, like that you give to everybody, I, like if I wanted to start using Legos, in my facilitations, I would imagine that like getting a bunch of repeated pieces like wouldn't necessarily be the easiest thing to do. That like buying just a bunch of random Legos and hoping you know for a, a good selection would be a lot easier. Do you think it's like it, it would be if somebody wanted to start using Legos? Do you think it's still okay to just use like little random pieces of of whatever they've got, or do you think that there's some there's definitely specific value to the same Legos, but is it? Do you think it is still possible to do some really great stuff with a real variety of of uh, pieces? Sure. Okay. 
Um, okay, so first, I just want to say that anybody can buy these bags. These are oh. anybody can buy them. Uh -huh. so they come in a box of a hundred, and um, they're five hundred dollars for a hundred. Yeah, so they're about five bucks each, which makes them a really, really good buy because there's a minifigure inside this bag, and a minifigure alone, if you go to a Lego store, is around three dollars. I think. Yeah, it's like three. Three or four dollars. So, um, so getting this bag is really, and I just want to say, to start off with saying, if you have five hundred dollars, and um, or if you know somebody that you could go in with, and you could split them up so that everybody could have like a, a, a bunch of these, um, that would be a great idea. And these are a really um, a real cool little tool. Mm -hmm. um, we can also show everybody kind of like what's in there. Can you see that pretty well? So if you wanted to put your own little bag together, the only thing I would suggest is um, there's, a, there's a couple of key pieces. You want to fish out a minifigure for me in the base plate? I'm sure so, your listeners are probably <laughs> hating the sound of these bags. Yeah, sorry about <laughs> Lego Yep, chalk, nails and chalk. There's this piece which is a nice, I'm, I'm showing for people that are just listening and that can't see, um, it's a little flat base plate we call it and this one has got four little knobs going this way and then it's got six little knobs so it's a six by four studded base plate that's key in order for people to start building what we would call a tower and then this is the other piece which is um, a little minifigure and a little minifigure here just is made up of three parts it's got the um, Lego man or woman person's head their pants, and then a blue, this one's a blue shirt, but sometimes the shirts are red. So you can't really do Lego series play without people because the whole thing is about people. So you have to have the people. And then in this little bag that Steven just opened up for me, there's like spinner things and there's a flag. Um, so there's pieces in here that people very quickly will start using metaphorically um, like this yellow piece could be an idea or it could be a bright shiny personality or it could be a light bulb and then this pink one it's a flower but it can also represent heart and compassion um, or decorating um, so these little pieces add to sort of the storytelling so having creative pieces if you just have Lego bricks that are just a plain um, just a Lego like just a regular good old brick like that that isn't very interesting. You really need the extra little fun creative pieces in order for people to then quickly start putting it together to say what their little person is up to. I mean, so it's storytelling. But I also think that you don't have to have all the pieces the same. But what I would do if I was just, let's say, taking Lego out of my basement to do this, first of all, I'd make sure it was clean because a lot of the Lego that kids have played with has been chewed on and... That's real. Yep, you that's want, very helpful. Yeah, you don't want that extra barrier. So one of the things about having it in a small bag, another pitch for these bags, is that if you're using it with professionals, people are thinking, okay, well then it's a thing, it's a real thing, it's not just this, you know, this crazy person got Lego out of you know off eBay and brought it in here and told us to build with it it actually is a professional bag of Lego and it looks like it's something that um, has been made for a business setting so kind of having your material professional I think is one of the things that lowers um, resistance and um, but you can make your own little bag so here is Michael's craft store it's just a large bead bag from the craft store. And then you can just throw some Lego bricks in it. Um, as long as you have the minifigure, you really can do Lego series play to get started. Do you usually let people keep the bags? And this isn't it like, like is, do you see a value in doing that is more my question. Like not like whether you all, or, but do you see a value in like, this is your bag forever. Like you get to keep this Lego versus like, no, I'm taking it back. Like, 
Um, people definitely want to keep their Lego. There's no doubt about it. We sometimes will say to them, well, take, you know, if we give you our Lego, then we won't have Lego to do it with the next people. So, um, but it depends. Like sometimes the $500, depending on the workshop, we'll put that into the price. And then everybody gets to build something with Lego. And then um, and what we might do is open a workshop with the little mini bag and then close the workshop with a little mini bag and then tell people they can take their thing. And then we always say, you know, put it next to your computer. And then when your coworkers ask you, you can tell them the story about what this thing is. Right. So it becomes a transitional object that they take home with them and that they can use later. It's also excellent marketing because it's on their desk and they're like remembering, oh, I had so much fun at that Lego thing. So it, um, yeah, if you can put it in the budget, then it's perfect. When, when you say they're, those are like the official and professional bags, do you mean like those are the Lego Serious Play like bags? That, and that's where you're saying you can order the, the 100 bags for $500? Is that like where just an online store? Where do people actually, this is the nitty grittiest question, right? But how, no, how so you get them directly from Lego's website, and I believe it's shop.lego.com. But you can just Google Lego Serious Play, and the best place to get it from is Lego. Oh. So I think that you can sometimes source it from Amazon, but it'll be more expensive. So you can even go to just Lego's website and just search Serious Play, and there will be uh, four different kits that'll come up. And this one's called the Window Exploration Bag. That's and it's your favorite. Uh, yeah, you don't want people, I just want to tell people, don't buy all the Lego on there because you'll spend a lot of money and you won't know what to do with it. Because there's a kit on there that's very expensive and unless you've taken the training, it's called the connectors kit, you'd get it and you'd be, and I've had people phone me. In fact, we got, we did some work with um, an IT company because they ordered it and then didn't know what to do with it. And so then they called us and that's how, because there's no instructions in the box. As long as everybody knows, if you're buying a box, there's no instructions in there. It's just a box of Lego. So um, yeah, so as Steven said, lego.com, and then go to the search bar and type in serious play and Lego kits are gonna come up and you're gonna see the, um, the one that Steven mentioned, the exploration bags for 100 exploration bags in a box. Awesome. Yeah, very nitty gritty question, but like I, I can see some people definitely wanting to know where, where to get them. Um, that's so cool. And we priced them out. Steven went to the trouble, believe it or not, of getting the price of each one of these pieces if you bought it separately. And it was around $15. Oh, so you yeah. couldn't, y'all, even is at the bulk rate, like doing the best you could, you couldn't do a better job than, huh, good to know. Yeah, that's, that's really helpful. Yeah, it's, we actually made some uh, videos uh, explaining the contents of the four different kits as well, and I believe those are on our website. So. And they're not up yet. Oh, coming <laughs> up. <laughs> in the future when this is live. And we actually open each box and show people what what's in the box. No, we're going. To, we just made them, and we're going to put them up so that people can look and get a really nice look at what's in there before they buy them. Great. Where, uh, so assuming that we're in the future, someone's watching this video, where, where can they find it right now? Um, where will it land on your website when it's posted? Or will it be easy to find just through navigation on the website? Um, probably we'll put it under resources and, okay. um, or maybe even frequently asked questions. I don't know, I haven't, haven't thought of it, but no worries. Um, yeah, okay, there you go. That's a, that's a note to style. We'll make it easy. Okay. <laughs> Uh, maybe we can send you a hot link and you can embed it into the video or something to that effect. Like yep. right, right here. It'll just be right there. <laughs> you know, click on that. <laughs> Y'all know YouTube. I'm impressed. That's a very good YouTube trick. I have, I have one more question. Uh, Meg, do you have other? Yeah. Um, okay. So I have, I have one. And this is, this is kind of a, a big question that I'd like you to interpret in whatever ways you'd like. Um, so we've talked about like a lot of concrete things. Um, Y'all work in very tangible ways, and that's a that's something that a lot of facilitators um, don't have access to, right? Like a lot of you were mentioning that idea of um, the if this is just cognitive um, versus being physical, it has a very big, um, a very it, it's felt in a very different way. So I would say if you were 
talking to a facilitator who doesn't do anything that's tangible, who is only working in, in language or only working in cognition, um, what are some what's some what are some bits of advice you would give them for um, even if they're not using Lego for learning from some of the things that you think Lego does well or from learning from some of the things that are are tangible like what are some bits of advice you'd give them for like bringing that into their work? Okay, couple of, couple of things. I'm just going to first of all, I want to mention. We have these two books that we've written, and this one is um, this one is just all games. There's not a lot of Lego in there. It's mostly activities that you can do. It's a creative facilitator's guide, so it's strategic play, the creative facilitator's guide to activities for engagement. So if people want just some games and activities to do, this book is full of them, and it's got like openers and closers. Things people can do sitting down, things people can do standing up. I wrote it with um, Dr. Denise Meyerson, who's from Australia, and we just basically put together the best ones that we love, and that's what's in this little book. Um, and then this book here is the strategic play. It's the What the Duck book, and it shows you, so that little duck activity, there's only six Lego bricks in it. We've got about, uh, there's 15 to 20 activities in here of things you can do and variations of activities that you can do with your workshop with just Lego, with just like six bricks. So you don't have to go buy all this Lego if you just want to get, you know, these six bricks right here. Um, as long as everybody has the same bricks, all of those activities, uh, you can do them. So that's, I just wanted to make that point. Now, the other thing that I, would, I was going to show you is if people don't want to do Lego serious play, but they still like the humor and the fun and all of that that goes with it, we also have these cards. So I'll just show these cards to you. And actually, this will maybe explain how the Lego gets used as well. But can you see that card? Okay. So what these cards are is um, Steve and I came up with a whole bunch of things that people talk about that are going on for them. And we actually made the little Lego vignette and then took a picture of it and put a word underneath it. So this one says gossip. Um, oh gosh, that's adorable. So they're like little Lego settings that people might, oh my gosh. And so there are things that people maybe don't actually want to talk about. Um, so Steven's got some here for me. Like, we've got security issues. <laughs> <laughs> so if you can't see these, you should find a, a, a like if you're a person who's listening, these are adorable. Are these on your website? Yeah, these are on our website. Okay. So when it comes to things like resistance or a lot of hugging in a row, lack of engagement is people um, just, is that just people talking? Oh, they're, not their desk. they're not even at their desk. They're all just hanging they're around just the coffee. Drinking, they're just drinking coffee. They're okay. not at their desk. Uh, but here's one. The old boys club. It's three, <laughs> three people with swords and one's holding a key. Yeah, and they've all got gray hair. They've all got gray hair and like, great chiseled, great chiseled faces. <laughs> and this one says bottlenecks, and it's basically um, some bottles on a conveyor belt, and it's broken down, and the guy's got a cell phone, so he's calling someone for help. And how do you how do you use these, or like how do you use them rather than the Legos? Okay, so. We created these. This is this one says no innovation. It's like a guy in a castle. Okay. Okay. And these are these are all Lego um, minifigures, and we've got two hundred of these cards. Because when we first started, we only had like we did forty five, and people were going crazy, and we we're like, oh, we want this one, and we want this one. So anyway, we now have two hundred of these cards. And the way that we, when we first came up with them, we came up with the idea. Of, you know when you do the first meeting with a client and when you're trying to get them to tell you what's going on so you can design a workshop so we created the card so they could get to it quicker because it would take them we we recognized two things in those meetings um, and the one the one problem was that people people took a long time to tell their story and couldn't actually get to the issue because of embarrassment or you know, just sometimes they would talk about their problems and they would go sort of on some kind of a tour um, and then come back to why they thought they were going to bring you in. And maybe they would end up saying something like, oh, my God, this is so complicated. I can't explain it to you. And so then how could you ever help us? 
And so we realized that by not having a structured interview, we went, went, then went to a structured interview, um, but then we found that this was magic, is you just give them 25 of these cards, and you say, put them in three piles, sometimes, always, and never, and then they sort them, and they can sort them in like five minutes, bang, 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 and then we have them pick up the sometimes or the um, always pile, and then we'll say now prioritize them. If you had a million dollars to spend to fix something, what would you spend your million on? And then very quickly they're going to say one problem. This is what I want to do. I want to want to deal with engagement. Let's say we'll say lack of engagement or gossip or whatever the problem is. Um, then we found that if you use them in a group where you had three people in the boardroom and you gave everybody their own pile, then each person's pulling up a different card. And so then we added this, tell us the story. Why is that important to you? Tell us why you think you'd spend your million dollars. And then we realized that they work perfectly for a conversation starter. Uh, we then started using them for root cause analysis where we would lay them down on a table and we could see cause and effect. So you could use them like a thinking bubbles or whatever. You start moving them around to tell some kind of, so then storyboarding emerged. Um, what are some of the other things that we came up with? Those are the two that came to my mind. We've got the superhero as well. Yeah, we have the superhero and kryptonite. Do you want to explain that one? Sure. So this activity is superhero kryptonite, and what you have to do is you find a card and you say, um, my superhero is fighting, and I'll just grab the first one. So my superhero is fighting Gossip. Oh. Okay, but my kryptonite is... Okay, I'm not going to use that one. It's a different one. Okay, that one's... <laughs> <laughs> he just, uh, <laughs> is and what's um, zapping my superpower is uh, is safety concerns. So really, what the idea is is quickly you can say you know this is what I'm passionate about um, in the organization, but this is one issue that I find is really you know killing my energy. You want to pass me the orange cards? Sure. So we so the decks are divided into. Um, because we found out through research that we needed to have only 25 uh, cards in a deck for sorting. Any more than 25 was too confusing for people. So we started putting them into decks. So this deck here, and you can use any decks and you can mix them all up. And we have like naked branding. I don't know if you can see that on the mm -hmm. box. So that facilitators, if they wanted to buy this, it wouldn't like have our big brand on there. It would be a little bit more hidden. So we've got like very, very... In a, in a watermark, a really tiny watermark, we have our name. But basically, they're designed for other facilitators to take. Because I hate it when a facilitator goes in and they've got like 200 tools with 200 brands. It's confusing. So yes. that's why we did the naked branding. But, um, but on this card here, you can see it says office. It says, sorry, culture clash. Yeah. OK, so we've got culture clash. We've got vigilanteism. <laughs> and we've got um, under construction. So this set was made to work with municipalities. So this is a community set. Gotcha. So anybody who, let's say, doesn't, you know, you've got, you, you get some stakeholders together to talk about a community issue, these are the cards for community issues. And then we put this deck together, um, which is... Organizational behaviors. Um, Jackie, I have a question for you. Sure. Are, so are these decks available on your website? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Is there an explanation of like what the different decks are on there? Okay. The yes. reason I'm asking is because we have a couple of questions we want to get to just sure. that we ask everyone. And I, it's not that I want, don't want you to explain them, but if, they, if it is available somewhere else, then I'd love to just direct people to go like check out that. So in summary, like there are different decks and some of them are specifically made for certain groups or certain settings. Yeah, and it's all on it's on the website under shop. You can okay. see diagnostic and there's also videos of Stephen showing you how to use them. And cool. then when you buy them, you get like a PDF book that gives you all the activities. Awesome. Cool. Okay. So it's not like the Lego kits where you're on your own. You've got like curriculum essentially with the cards. Cool. Yeah. yeah okay. Absolutely. Uh, all right. Awesome. Yeah. No, that's helpful, Meg. Yeah, I appreciate that. I was like trying to keep up by like taking notes, and I was like, okay, yeah, too much, too much for me. Um, great, y'all. Oh, first of all, I'm impressed by your creativity. Um, and 
what we're about to segment into or segue into is the least creative part of our interview, but it's something that we really enjoy. So these are questions that we ask everybody. So as Meg mentioned, they're the only questions that we have scripted that we want to hear every uh, facilitator share on. Um, and the, the big difference here is so we have about 10 questions um, and we, uh, we're not gonna ask follow-ups. We're not gonna dig into these. So we're just gonna ask these and, and um, y'all can answer them however, um, however works as a co-facilitator pair or individually. Um, we'll leave that up to you. These are uh, the hard-hitting questions, I dig it. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> I said these are the hard hitting questions. No, 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 they're not that hard. They're they're just interesting. Can we build it out of Lego to tell you the answer? Oh my gosh. Yes. Um, if we had more time, we would love to see all your Lego model answers. So yeah. Maybe part two. Maybe a part two. Yeah. Uh, okay. Here's our first question. What are three words you would use to describe facilitation? To describe facilitation. Um Interactive. Do you want to do a word? Safe. Powerful. Ooh, this is fun. I love that you said interactive and then it had to be interactive. Sorry, not supposed to follow up. Um, if you could pick one ground rule to apply to the entire world that everyone would have to follow, what would it be? Y'all can do one each. Okay. Um, mine would be turn taking. Listen generously. Did we lose Meg? Oh, Meg, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, what is something you still need to be reminded of as a facilitator? I think that um, I think that I get very entrenched in my frameworks, and I think that it's it's important to remember that when you're speaking to people, you're you're catering to their thinking style, not yours. And I think for me, um, I have to be reminded of what it was like when I didn't work in this kind of a creative space because we get so far into this that um, I always want to be so uh, appreciative of people and recognizing that this is not their reality of, of, um, of how they work. Um, and so for me, just always appreciating the fact that people have tough jobs and a lot of them don't like work and don't like each other and it's really um, the reality of their situation so just always being mindful of that is I think very important yeah uh, what do you do right before a facilitation what do we do uh, helium <laughs> 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 what do we do right before a facilitation? I think get into a room an hour early and make sure that um, the room's set up and we're ready and, you know, the space is going to be appropriate, you know, from a technical standpoint. You kind of check in with each other, you know, make sure that, um, you know, how are you feeling, anything you're concerned about, like those kinds of things we just do automatically. Um, but it's good to know, you know, if one of you has got a headache or there's something going on because the other person can compensate. I mean, that's, I just love co-facilitating because of the fact that there's two of you and you can just always be looking out for each other because, you know, life is live. You're going into a situation, you never know what's going to happen and you've really got, you've got your co-facilitator is key to, you know, having your back when, when, because anything can happen. Yeah. What do you do right after uh, a facilitation? High five. <laughs> I was going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do we do right after? Well, for us, we have a mess to clean up uh, because we take more stuff than, I don't know, anybody I know. And that can be really therapeutic, you know, cleaning up the room and putting all the Lego away. is. Um, but we debrief as we're doing it. So we're, we're always like talking, I mean, we debrief continuously anyway, but after the workshop, um, we, we make sure that we've got all the material so that we can bring it home. If there was anything we had to follow up on, we're making notes to make sure we, you know, that we haven't lost anything and um, basically planning for sort of closing it down. So we, we call it like the tear down, but that whole, that whole part of it is, is as important as the setup. Mm. 
what's a piece of facilitation advice you'd each like to give your five years ago self? Five years ago self. Um, Jeepers, what would you tell yourself? Um, I think that just to remember that it's a practice and every time you go out, it's going to be different and be flexible and just look at everything as a learning opportunity and everything's a gift. And I think just, I would just remind myself um, of the rich, fantastic learning I had. I mean, even right now, every single time we go out, we learn so much from our participants and they're always like thanking us, but we're always thanking them because we're in it together. Once we walk in the room, it isn't going to work if they're not working with us. And even the ones that you might think are a pain in the butt, they teach us so much as well. And, <clears throat> and they all bring a gift. Um, everyone's gift is different. And I just appreciate the people that, that join with us in this kind of activity because you ha they have to be brave. And, um, and I just, I just really, I just love the fact that we can continuously learn. It's really a journey. Yeah. What still stresses you out as a facilitator? Um, what stresses us out? I would say um, getting to venues on time and making sure that we have our materials. Um, it's pretty hard to do Lego series play without Lego. So, <laughs> um, but. I think just staying organized, it's, you know, I like to make sure that when we're, we're going to do a facilitation, we have a checklist and we make sure that we double check it, make sure that we have everything with us. Um, that's really the only thing that, you know, like not, I don't really get stressed out. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty, pretty flexible and adaptable, but I, you know, I really need to know that we have the materials that we need to, uh, to roll out a, a client workshop. And I would say the same thing. Just uh, it, I get stressed by thinking we've forgotten something. But um, I'm more likely to be worried about that. We do have a checklist that we use. So um, <clears throat> it's just that if one of us thinks that they put it in the car and they think the other person did it. But it, we can tell you so many funny stories about when we've showed up and there's been like no power or an amusement ride next door. We once <laughs> facilitated, and there was an amusement park. It was at a museum, and the guy came to test this merry-go-round, and every 15 minutes, merry-go-round music. At first, it was funny. It was like, oh, listen to that music. But then after, like, you know, 500 times of the music playing, it's sort of – but um, we have lots of those stories. And we, I think that, you know, we're at a point where we can pretty well roll with anything. We would just prefer not to. We like to have <laughs> the stuff that we need there. Yeah. One of these days we're gonna have to do a facilitator war stories episode or have people like record videos and send them to us and create a montage because new facilitators really do wanna hear those stories. We always could ask them ourselves. I'm curious, uh, so our question is what do you do to manage, or next question is what do you do to manage the stress? But just to twist that because y'all already gave us that specific stress, what do you do to manage the stress not based on what you were just talking about, like not the materials and not the other things, but do you have any tricks for managing stress just in general in the room? In the room? Yeah, when you're in the facilitation, what do you do to manage the stress? We're facilitating. So would, we are, would you frame that as stress for, for us or for stress yeah. that for us? Your own personal stress. The merry-go-round's doing its third round. Maybe you're getting stressed in a way that you haven't been before. What do you do? My coaching background is really uh, one of the most powerful tools that I lean on. And so I, I learned a lot about presence and, you know, being patient and, um, I, I, it's just one of those things. I'm, I'm not really sure if I could really articulate it, but, um, I, I have tools that I've developed just through experience, I guess, and just knowing that I have the confidence that I can, I can steer the workshop where it needs to go. Or if, you know, if it's fallen off the rails, you know, you need to know when to pull the plug if you have to. And sometimes. <sighs> oh no. <laughs> oh, no, we lost them again. I, it was working for so long. This one's falling off the rails. Uh, <laughs> what's good is that neither of us, if either of us cut out, do you think it would? I think if I'm, I'm always scared that if it cuts, if I cut out, like my biggest fear is me closing the window by accident. And then the whole thing just being like, boop, 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 boop. but I don't know. I don't know if that would happen. I would assume it would. Yeah. Well, We've got two more questions for them. So if anybody is um, is 
just stick around. We've got two more, wait, three more questions uh, for Jackie and Steven. We're going to hope that they tune back in. Um, the irony of this being right in the middle of the phrase falls off the rails and we're going to pull the plug is not lost on me. Um, I, I still think Google listens and knows what's up. Yep. Uh, OK. We'll just have to guess their answer. Okay. There we are. <laughs> so speaking of pulling the plug, no, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah. OK. Uh, All right. I think we got most of it. I think we captured like the, the, the vast, vast majority of that one. So um, I think you had one last point that she wanted to add. Yeah, on. I, just, I just wanted to say that I think that facilitators, um, the, biggest, the biggest thing that I, that, and you know, Stephen learned this in the coaching program, and I, I think we try to remind ourselves all the time, is that we don't own the outcome. The outcome belongs to the participants. And it is, if we're getting stressed, it could be because we're trying to force something. Um, so even if a conflict breaks out, I mean, I have a master's degree in that, so I actually love it if it happens because then we can manage it. And the teaching that comes out of that can be huge. So, um, you know, one of the things that we do too is we don't stick with the plan just because it's a plan. So if we have a plan, it's all written out, we have an agenda, if things aren't going well, we'll just totally switch the agenda. And that comes a little bit more from mastery, but I think for new facilitators, you want to make sure you've got plan A, B, and C, just in case what you thought was going to work or what you thought the client needed, um, they changed their mind about. I mean, you can walk in the room and they could say, oh, news break, new information, this just happened yesterday, and uh, we need to do something else. And you always want to make sure you've got a couple of things up your sleeve, just in case that happens. So, great. Okay. More. What's a unique place you facilitated? Japan. <laughs> we facilitated in Japan. That was totally, that was totally cool. Um, and we facilitated simultaneous translation. All right. With uh, Cantonese, Mandarin, Japanese, and then English, I suppose. And there were some people speaking French as well. It was yeah, for. Right. Uh, French, yeah. I don't know. Very cool. Okay. okay. <laughs> What's a not directly facilitation related experience that you think every facilitator should have? That's a tough one. I think coming to Whistler. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, I think every facilitator. I mean, I think travel is really important. I think that everybody really needs to get out of. You know, one of the things that we often can bring back, especially when we're doing um, innovation, is to be able to talk about other places that we've been to and other cultures that we've seen and other ways of doing things. So I think that um, I think traveling and and getting out of your comfort zone are I would suggest. Great. Is there a book that changed the way you facilitate? Well, the one book that we both really like is uh, David Rock, uh, Your Brain at Work. So that's a book that really, really has so many fantastic points in it that you almost want to circle every single sentence. But um, that one, and then the other book that I think is really great is a book that was written by Stuart Brown called Play. So those two books to me, I think, are... Um, Two of my favorite. Do you have one? Uh, David Gauntlet and is it Making is Connecting. Yeah, David Gauntlet, Making is Connecting is another is another good one. All Great. of those books on our website. We actually have a list of our favorite books. We probably could add a whole bunch more, um, but on our website, if you click on, um, I think it says resources, and then you click on books, there's a drop down with a hot link on uh, to Amazon on most of those books. Cool. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> this question's already been answered. Uh, do you have any online resources that you think others should check out? Yeah, and you know, there's lots of free stuff on our site too. You have to just poke around, but there's like some activities that you can try and do. If you go under resources, I think there's like, it's like free stuff. Um, and there's also some videos on there that you can watch that you can kind of see us in action. Um, yeah, what else is there? 
if you go if people wanted to go to the other website that we have which is strategicplay.ca that's our consulting site so .com is the training site for facilitators .ca is a site that is really uh, for end users for like for the client I shouldn't call them end users but it's for for client companies and on there, there are white papers that we've written on our workshops. There's also videos you can watch with people using Lego. Um, and what else is on there? On a blank. Yeah, there's there's stuff on there that people can see. Also on our website, if you go to strategicplay.com, if you go to the bottom, it says photographs. And you can watch a lot of, of the photographs, or you can see a lot of the photographs that we've taken that might help bring a little bit more color to this to the story um, and also on there our blog we put we write um, a few blogs every week and all the whole history of blogs is probably a lot of blogs on there that people can go in and read um, yeah so those are those might be interesting great sure. yeah thank you and what is um, one piece of advice that you have for everyone who's listening Oh, be kind to each other. Um, <laughs> never stop playing. Love it. Beautiful. Y'all, thank you so much. Um, are there ways that facilitators can find you personally? Like, do you use social media personally? If they wanted to email you, are there ways that folks can connect that you'd like to share? Um, they can email either of us. So this is uh, Stephen. Yeah, so I'm Stephen James at strategicplay.ca, or you can find me at LinkedIn, uh, Stephen Walling, and it's Stephen with a PH. And I'm on LinkedIn, uh, Jacqueline Lloyd on LinkedIn, um, but you can get me Jackie at strategicplay.ca, uh, and Jackie is J A C Q U I E. Great. And we'll put all of the links to those things um, and, and all of the like wonderful resources that you kind of shared throughout um, in the in the show notes for this. So, people And if want. people want to um, like us on Facebook, our Facebook is a strategic play training. Um, and if you like us there, you'll get all kinds of fun news and all kinds of stuff that's very uh, playful. Lots of um, articles go up about the whole idea of using creativity in workshops. So it could be it could be some neat stuff there too. Right. So facebook.com slash strategic play training. Yeah. I think okay. that is. Yeah. Great. All right. Well, y'all, thank you so much. Um, thanks everyone who tuned in. We'll be back with our last episode this week soon. But um, for now, thank you so much, Steve and Jackie. Y'all were great. Um, I, I really appreciate the attention and the wisdom that you shared with us. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yes, thank you so much for having us. These were great questions. This was a lot of fun. So um, really appreciate you inviting us, Meg. All right. Yeah, no problem. Well, thank you so much. And we'll, we're going to sign off now and uh, catch you on the other side.